It's a great question. What a lot of pilots don't understand in the data collection process is the time and money that, go, that is involved with gathering data. The ACT graphs on average cost $500 each, and there's about a 90 to 95% success ratio of those using. What's frustrating is two of them didn't work, so that's now about more 10, 15% didn't work. So $500 per ACT graph. We pay pilots up to $500 to be involved in this data gathering. And then it's, um, it can be several hundred dollars to ship it over to a foreign domicile or maybe uh, $50 to $60 to ship it locally. That adds up. And that's all in the company's time. The company has taken the time. The company has taken the money to ask you to help gather data to help improve your parents. So it's very expensive and it's very frustrating on my part when I I'm the one of the, the, uh, the folks, ALP is allowed to come in and look at the data and to make sure it's accurate. So when the pilot's act graph comes off, that's downloaded to a computer and then we put it up on a screen and we walk through every sleep cycle and every operational cycle that that pilot went on, compare it to the pairing and see if it matches because the gap to graph is not always, is not as accurate. Um, so it's incumbent on the pilots, if you are doing this study, that you fill out the log as detailed as possible so that when I'm sitting in this windowless room and looking at this actigraph up here with all these lines, that is pretty straightforward. And I know when you've taken a nap and I know when you, this kind of sounds like Santa Claus, I know when you've been sleeping, I know when you're awake. <laughs> and uh, for goodness sake, uh, please fill them out correctly. That's a good question. Well, um, a little history on one of the pairings we, we revised was in Hong Kong and it was known as the Saigon Loop. And with that pairing, we uh, had a lot of uh, fatigue reports, some several fatigue events, and the pairing was disputed. It came to us to gather data, and on, in gathering that data, um, we did not follow that protocol, and that protocol wasn't in highlighted, bold faced blinking on the materials we gave them. That has since changed. We revised a lot of the material we give to pilots and, and emphasized that we need date, data. We need them wearing the actographs three days prior to, the, to their pairing and three days after. And the reason why is you need a baseline. So it's beautiful to see sleeping from nine o'clock till, you know, till six o'clock every night. And then boom, now they start their pairing. And then you can see the changes or fluctuations on their sleeping versus their operational. So, after the Saigon Loop came out, we recognized that they weren't getting sleep, but we also recognized that we weren't doing the data gathering correct. When we had sent this data to the scientists who want a more controlled environment, and we have to step up and say, well, operations are important, the controlled environment is secondary, we'll try our best, they asked for the three and three to help out that. So after we did the first initial study, we, did, uh, we made the changes, we made a FERC parameter, and then the company offered, say, let's gather data on the results. And so we just gathered data on the results and we got, sorry, we, we were able to get the three and three and now you can really see the, the difference or understand the sleep changes that go to it. And it's really beautiful to see that, hey, this, this pilot here is going to be flying all night. Two days prior, that pilot is starting to shift their circadian sleep left or right, depending on what works for them. And it's really nice to see that pilots almost across the board prepare, prepare as best they can uh, for challenging parents. I see every single fatigue report. I see both it from ALPA and I see it from the company. I review every single uh, fatigue report that comes through. And then it is my job to come back to the company and tell them what is systemic or what issues they have. And that is only by me going through every fatigue report and looking f and diving into their schedules and seeing what they're saying, and sometimes contacting the pilot. Uh, I had to contact one pilot the other day, new hire was approaching their, their sleep, their sleep um, preparation, I think incorrectly, and I gave them a technique that might help them uh, prepare better for their parents. The biggest, not so much as trend, but the, the most causal factor is revisions. 50% of fatigue events where a pilot is removed from their pairing are caused by revisions. Or not caused, are, um, one of the causal factors is revisions. And the revision is very important for the pilots to understand is 
the key word I want all pilots to do when they're analyzing it and, and is to do what's called a look back. If you're given a revision, don't look for it. Don't try to look at the legality of it. Don't look at it on what the pairing is. Don't look for it. Look back. When did you go to, how long you've been awake? That really plays into what your capability is going forward. If you don't do the look back, it doesn't matter what you do in looking forward. You can sit there and talk to the duty officer for hours about the legality of it. But if you do not do a personal look back and see where, how long you've been awake or how much is in your tank, then you may not be aware of what pitfall, where you're going to hit your fatigue cliff later on in that pairing. They say if you've been up for 18 hours, that uh, you are legally drunk. Now, if you've gotten a small nap in there, like a lot of, a lot of guys we've seen, uh, if you're asking about trends, Pete, in some of the data collection software we've seen, we've seen there's three types of sleepers. There's I sleep only once during my, my hub turn period, and that's when I land. I sleep twice. That means I sleep sometime during the day, and I sleep during a hub turn, or there's the three sleep. There's a sleep as soon as you land in your layover point. There's the pre-flight sleep, and then there's the hub turn sleep. Uh, I'm one of those guys, I, you know, nap when you can. Uh, and that, if you're able to get a nap before any type of duty period right before it, you've got um, the capability to go a lot further on that. But there, there is some science, we do have some literature that does talk about, like the, 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 um, the good report, I'll try to put that on our website. In that it describes the differences of eight hours, 13 hours and beyond um, your alertness level. And there's a lot of documentation out there for that. I've reached out to the other airlines and we've created a email circle to talk about it because they look at it differently. A lot of the airlines I, I um, converse with are under 117. They have a lot more fatigue calls than we do. Why is that? 117, in my opinion, is uh, whenever uh, a duty extension is reached and they're asked the pilot to go further, the choice they're given is uh, yes or no and it's a fatigue call. In our um, system, we rarely approach uh, FAA, FAA limits. We rarely approach the duty limits for our you know, 16 hours. So what it is, is our, duty, our, our fatigue calls are well within duty limit range. Granted, it's a different system, being especially on the night side. So we do not get as many fatigue calls as the other airlines do. We do share a lot more information across the board, whether it's through um, conferences. I go to two or three conferences a year. And in those conferences, um, in the beginning, we were asking uh, how it works, and then now it's kind of turned around. I've had several um, airlines come to us. Uh, the other day, I believe it was Atlas, I spent some time talking to the Alpa rep and uh, the company reps, and we all met in a room together to talk about the software we're using and to talk about how we uh, execute our uh, FRMP.